everyone. Welcome once again to Geeks Not Nerds, the podcast. I'm Captain Logan, and I'm here with the real Manos. Hi, Manos. Hey, Logan. How you doing? Welcome back to the channel. It's been a while. I know. It's been very, very, very long. Missed it. Missed all of you. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing great. And I'm ready to talk about writing. We haven't done a writing podcast in a long time, and I've had Manos on before talking about writing, and we haven't done really just a regular podcast topic like this in a while either. <laughs> um, so I thought it would be cool if I brought Manos on and we talked about a very specific part of the writing process that um, I've never done a whole show on before, and I uh, thought this this could be interesting. It might be worth exploring. Um, the notion of writing what you know, which is one of the big cliches is really in the writing world that you hear a lot. Um, you know, you know how, how do you how do you uh, make effective storytelling? Well, you write what you what you know, and that that uh, that cliche is, I think, up there with things like show don't tell, where you hear it so much it gets to the point where it doesn't mean anything anymore. And I thought it would be great for us to explore that that notion, um, writing from personal experience, what exactly that means, why it's important, is it important, and what advice um, Manos, you and I can maybe give to folks that, um, that don't know uh, how or if they should implement that idea. So the first thing I want to ask you, Manos, is um, how much do you think of your own personal background experience everyday life you put into your fiction? I think quite a bit. I haven't really measured it uh, exactly, but I know, I, 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 I suppose it comes in into maybe the majority of, um, of what. I, I get a lot of my influence. I actually come across, I don't know about you, I come across a lot of my story ideas, not just for Red Knight, but in just in general, sometimes by accident. Um, I don't know if you know, it, it, it's like, you know, epiphanies hit me. Like, oh, hey, why don't I write, you know, this about pirates and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes you don't know where it comes from, too. It, do, it doesn't. It's it's definitely the inspiration. But um, I, I, I have a hard time trying to write anything completely cold. I, I've always viewed art in general, but we're talking specifically about writing. Art, to me, is always about communication. And uh, feel free to agree or disagree with that. Uh, you're, you're, I do. Oh, well, good, good, good. Well, oh, good. It's going to be a much better conversation. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, art is communication, and you're you're getting across certain points. Um, and it can be about really anything. And here and here's the thing, I I, I am sometimes influenced by you know my own either personal history or his or history of you know people I know. Uh, kind of get incorporated into story ideas and characters. And sometimes it's new stories I come across uh, that, you know, affect me in certain ways and get me to write. So, yeah, there's there's quite a bit that, uh, you know, come comes across throughout my writing. And, and, and uh, I was listening to Tarantino talk about this, Quentin Tarantino. And he talks, a, he talks a lot about how, you know, whatever you're going through kind of makes it into the writing and you have to allow it. And I, I, I thought that was really insightful what he was talking about because he was talking about like it doesn't have to be an obvious way. Like if you're writing about the Civil War and your dog dies, it doesn't be, the story you're writing doesn't become about a dead dog, but it's there. Uh, in in the, in the work, you know, even if it's just simply emotional uh, and not literal. And uh, I, I, I think if you're true to whatever you're writing, you have to kind of just let it go, even if you're not trying to. Because uh, there's like two ways of going about it. You can go, oh, man, this thing that happened to me would make a totally good story. Uh, you know, that that's one way it can happen. And another way it can happen is you start completely cold with a fictional idea and something either that has happened to you or a point of view on on, on the situation makes it in. Uh, and I, I think that's also a good way of knowing it's working, really, because it feels real. It feels like something you're trying to bring across rather than some fiction you're pulling out of the air yeah and that's that's exactly right that's the most important thing to me uh about this is effective writing is making a person 
believe the world that you're creating. And one of the ways that that uh, you, you can most easily go about doing that is by integrating in the things that you simply know a lot about and that you can describe in detail. So when you, uh, when you have a character and you're thinking, what should this guy do for a living? Or uh, what should this guy's hobbies be? And things like that. I don't think that it is inherently uninteresting or uncreative to pull from your own wheelhouse. And I think that some people get the get the idea that because the creative writing is supposed to be creative, that somehow it's like un, uninteresting or lame or something to use parts of your own life. One of the things that I that uh, that always hit me about you, Manos, is that uh, you set a lot of your stuff in the place that you live, and you're not bashful about that. Um, I know, uh, you, you know, like like a lot a lot of the stuff Manos does, especially Red Knight, is set in Norfolk, Virginia. Why is it set there? Well, because he can make that place real. He lives there. He's been there forever. He knows a lot about the place. Um, he can he can set it. He he can he can set uh, scenes in real places, and uh, he can make those places come alive for us. Um, that's not to say that you can't create a fictional place and also make it come alive for us, but I think that it works a lot better if you can draw from things that you that, that you understand that you know really well. Um, and and so I think people think that sometimes that, that it's somehow unimaginative to um, to just you know write things that you're already really familiar with that like that like imagination is making it all up. And I don't think that's true. I, I agree. I think people who might say that, like you're being lazy, I, I, I wonder if people who say that have actually ever written anything. Um, well, because, it, you know, you know it sounds like one of those smart fan things to say that, you know, you can get some people to agree with. But you know what? It's 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 not true in real life when you start writing, actually, you know, working on, you know, uh, projects. I, well, you know, one of the things I, I, uh, I don't know if I told you this, but I originally was going to uh, place uh, Red Knight in Dallas, Texas. And I realized, like, after a few scripts, like, I don't know anything about Dallas, Texas. <laughs> I've never yeah. been there. I don't know anybody who's been there. Um, I thought it would be an interesting place to set it, but I, I, I don't really have anything uh, to really make it feel grounded. So that's when I thought, well, why don't I just do what Stan Lee and, you know, the Marvel people did, uh, is put, you know, their stories in New York so they can actually have a you know, authentic feeling to them. Uh, even if it's just, you know very very you know secondary to the story and plus there's a lot of kind of cool stuff about this area that i thought would you know be really neat to incorporate in like a comic book universe when i was in uh writing school when i was in college uh and, and taking a lot of writing workshops i read a lot of stories that were set in the town that i lived in because that's where we were and people lived there and they knew the town <laughs> And I, I would I would have to stop myself because every now and again I would be like, oh man, another story set in Lawrence and then, you know, Lawrence, Kansas. And then I'm like, well, yeah, but that's that's what these people know. They can make it feel real and make it authentic. And the thing that I had to keep reminding myself of is I might know about that town, but I'm one of the, you know, 100,000, 150,000, whatever it is, people that live there. Um, what about the rest of the world? You know, for, for, for other for other people reading this, um, they're going to be learning about this place. It's going to be set, you know, play, not exactly an exotic place by any stretch of the imagination, but, it, but, it, but, it, but it's a place that other people won't know anything about. And if you start, uh, you, you know, you, if you start uh, describing, say, uh, a, a bar that a person goes into or the movie theater or something, and you've actually been there and you can make it feel like a real place... Um, then uh, it, it adds a lot more credibility and off, uh, you know, authenticity. Yeah, it helps build a world. Uh, yeah. Whether you're building uh, a story that's set in Tantooine or you know Kansas or uh, Norfolk, uh, if you if you actually you know seem like you're believing uh, building a believable world, uh, then yeah, it's really not going to be you know that that. You know, hard for you know the reader or the viewer to really get into it. I think some people find it really constrictive. I, th I think some people think that, uh, especially writing genre fiction, you, you, you know, that that the point of writing fiction is coming up with the big novel idea that nobody's ever written before. And I don't think that is the point of fiction. I feel like if I feel like that's a really cynical way to look at it because I feel like if you look at fiction um, like that, inevitably 
one of these days, or perhaps it's already happened, we're going to, as as a culture, run out of ideas. <laughs> yes. And if you and if you look at it that way, you're going to be really depressed all the time because you're going to think, I came up with this brilliant idea nobody's ever come up with before, and. The, and next month, you're going to either watch the movie where it happened or somebody's going to release it. Yeah, I've had that happen uh, a number of times. I'm sure maybe you, you have too. Yeah, absolutely. Where, you know, uh, you know, somebody comes up with something else like, oh, man, I got to totally either change this or rewrite <laughs> it. Um, and, you know, I've seen that happen a couple of times, you know, yeah. Um, not not just with Red Knight, but just a couple other you know story. You know, occasionally I, I just have to completely drop something. It's like, well, this is way too much, like this other thing. And you got to remember, um, when you do create something, it's your point of view. So, you know, if you write a vampire story and there's eight billion of them released in you know <laughs> one year, or, or a zombie story, which is now like you know all over the place. Um, what makes that story unique is you, the writer or creator or the artist. Um, this is your, um, uh, this is your story. This is your point of view. This is your outlook on life. Uh, so this is what makes it different and unique. Uh, yeah, if you make it a wooden thing where you're trying to just bring in that, like I said, novel element that nobody's brought to it before, um, chances are it's it's going to read like any other vampire or zombie story anybody's ever written. But the, the thing that you can bring to it is your unique perspective. And that's based on your personal experiences and the life that you've led. Um, and so uh, that brings me to the word original. People think that that word doesn't mean anything anymore because there are no original ideas. But originality comes from that perspective. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> um, so I, I see things all the time uh, that, that are w w when I when I see you know you know really um, creative and, um, and and interesting um, and, and, and especially um, you know you know nuanced and thoughtful stories uh, where I say well that felt very original and then I might be able to point to six other stories that did that story but they didn't do it in exactly that way. Uh, that's that's true. I mean. <laughs> That that will happen quite a bit where you can just go, oh, well, this movie 20 years ago is pretty much like, you know, this new original thing you think is awesome. Uh, I mean, like, like, uh, like, for instance, like, uh, I don't know, maybe this is a bad example because I've heard people actually say this is a ripoff. <laughs> but <laughs> it, like, you know, The Matrix and, you know, um, a Ghost in the Shell. You know, yeah, uh, that's, that's a, no, that's a great example because famously people think that about it. But, um, you know, I, I, I tend to think that The Matrix brought some things to the table that were a little different. Yeah, that's that's true. I mean, and, you know, they don't they don't, uh, you know, not not just visually because one's animated ones. Um, uh, one's, uh, yeah, uh, they both have, you know, their own kind of like they're, they're both trying to tell two different types of story, even though they're, they're using a lot of the same kind of elements. Uh, so that's what that's what the Witkowski, uh the Witkowskis, you know, brought, you know, versus uh, the creators of, you know, Ghost in the Shell film and manga and stuff like that. Um, and and uh, oh, yeah, I mean, let's see, uh, like Battle Royale versus uh, Hun Hunger Games, for instance. Yeah, uh, I think those are two good examples. I mean, they're basically the same story idea, uh, but they're pretty different films. Oh, I haven't read the book yet, but and I think a lot of that just comes in in characterization, you know, in in the in the people involved. Am I invested? Exactly. Am, am I invested in a different reason, in a different way? Excuse me, from why I was invested in in the other thing. Um, I, I got to tell you, I understand people that that said that the Matrix was too derivative of Ghost in the Shell, but I I I was in I was invested in. Um, I mean, they're they're kind of archetypal, but I still liked those people. Yeah, and so um, you know, I think it's I think it's a, it's a line everybody has to draw in 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 the sand differently, right? Uh, the difference between um, between inspired and deriving. <laughs> you know, what, what's the difference between inspiration and in derivative? Um, everything you've ever read that you thought was brilliant, the guy who wrote it probably. <laughs> 
could tell you, well, it's not as good as this other thing that I was thinking of when I wrote it. Exactly. Uh, the only people who can claim, you know, this are, you know, the original cavemen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we go back to antiquity. Yeah, we talked about. And these guys were great because they didn't know what they were doing. I mean, they, like, like the like the, the beauty of of um of, of fiction, the beauty of art in general, is that. The things that we tend to uh, really really latch on to and that become you know patterns that keep successfully working over and over again um, in in uh, in art and eventually become like like formulas. Yeah. Um, it's not like anybody invented them and said, I bet people will totally buy into this and think this is a good idea over and over again. Yeah. It, it happens by accident. It happens because we explore these things and they become patterns because we figure out what people like as we as we go along and what 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 people find endearing and that sort of thing mm -hmm. um and so because of that uh you're you're gonna build on things you're gonna be inspired by things and so i, I do think I, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference but i think largely there's a big difference between i straight up wrote this again and this couldn't exist without this other thing i think those are i think those are different ideas yeah yeah and um i I, I, you know, I don't know. There's something just so when you when you see a um, film that's so obviously derivative. I don't know. To me, it always strikes me as to maybe it's because you know, you know, I think like a writer, so I can I can actually sometimes get a feeling like, man, this is totally just cashing in and trying to be a ripoff. And then I've seen things that are a lot like something others, and it's like, well, this this person, this creator is doing something here. Um, so it, it really is, you know, it really does go back to the, the, the creator over and over again. And well, what, so I think you can, you can feel intent in a word. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. let's see, um, I guess when you think about, you know, even when you like take it out of, uh, a universe that we're familiar with, like, you know, like say, like say Star Wars and, uh, I'm a big fan of, um, uh, Brian K. Vaughan comic saga. Uh, both those universes feel authentic uh, to me because they obviously have a lot of the creator, well, especially with saga, a lot of the creator, you know, just adding, uh, you know, uh, bits of bits of the life of the. Uh, there, there's a lot of scenes in um, saga, for instance, that are very maternal and the scenes between the parents and then the grandparents when they came into the uh, storyline you know yeah this is a really crazy strange space universe with a lot of fantasy science fiction going on um but when i see the scenes with the baby when i see uh the parents and the grandparents like uh relating to each other that feels that that came somewhere that just didn't you know, that just didn't come out of some, you know, computer, you know, <laughs> trying to write or, you know, the famous million monkeys trying to type a, uh, a, a, you know, a screenplay. Yeah, there wasn't a committee that got together and said, what uh, uh, what kind of pathos can we make up that'll make a person cry? Yeah, yeah. You know, that came from... It's very, it's very different. And I think a lot of time you can tell when something actually comes from, from, from a place, from, from the person who wrote it. And it, it doesn't have to be blatant. We don't have to read it and go, I wonder if he experienced, you know, you know, you know exactly this thing. And as a writer, I don't think that you have to necessarily have experienced every, um, every emotional moment that you put in the book either. Yeah. I, think, uh, the, I think that a lot of the time, uh, the, because, you know, you know, writing is about finding some sort of a truth. And I feel, I, when we're talking about telling stories, yeah. and I feel like, um, you know, except for when we're just straight up being farcical, but even then sometimes it's satirical truth. Um, yeah. But, like, but like I, I think that I, what, what'll, what'll happen uh, a lot of the time is that you will, you will stumble upon uh, something that feels very real and feels and, and, and is very truthful um, through exaggeration. Um, and one of, one of the classic examples of that, of course, is 1984. Mm-hmm. Which is just like, you, you know, you know, an extremely um, overtly exaggerated future, and yet you can you can see things that are maybe subtly 
going on actually in your real society when you when you look at that. Um, and so, you know, I, I use that as a as an extreme example of extremism. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's actually very good because he was trying to put he was uh, trying to put point, uh, you know, uh, political philosophy uh, into the sci-fi universe. Uh, that you know, you know, made sense. That it made, and he, and he did this with uh, uh, with Animal Farm. You know, t- you know, taking uh, something that, yeah, it's basically a story of the future, or you know, Animal Farm is you know, pigs and stuff like that. But you 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 look at it and you know what what they're talking about, um, and you know that's that's that, that's really that that gets to the heart of things. Um, Oh, I was just about to say something about. Uh... <laughs> oh, I forgot. I completely... <laughs> That's okay. Maybe you'll maybe you'll think of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I had a really awesome point that was totally super cool, and I can't remember it. <laughs> oh no! Well, I'll talk about something totally unrelated, and then maybe you'll. <laughs> like um, one of the one of the things that uh, we were we were told a, a lot um, in. Uh, when, when I was when I was in college uh, and taking writing classes, especially from I always like to mention Adam DeNoyer because I I, th- I think he's, he was just a uh, fantastic um, um, professor and mentor for me. Is uh, he used to always say um, that uh, one of the most important things to keep in mind is job stuff. Uh, and and when he says mm-hmm. job stuff, he's also referring to uh, hobbies and things like that, like I was talking about earlier. Um, just because you're writing, and, and you know, a lot of our listeners probably, uh, if, if they're if they're writers, um, might like to write genre fiction, because um, you know, well, we, we talk about comics and Batman and Star Trek all the time. Um, uh, if if you're writing a uh, genre fiction, just keep in mind that just because you're writing something that might on the surface be be really outlandish, or like Manos was saying with Saga, you know, you know, some kind of really. Um, over the top, unreal kind of universe doesn't mean that you can't ground it with actual things that you've dealt with and experienced yourself. Um, I wrote a vampire story. It's funny you mentioned vampires. Um, yeah. I, wrote a, I, I wrote a vampire story when I was in college um, about a guy who worked at a mortuary because that's what I was doing at the time. And, you know, at first, and when I was a kid, I had that same thing I mentioned earlier, Manos, of, 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 of uh, people thinking, well, if I write about myself, it's lame, it's dull, I, I want to make up everything, you know, I want to, I want to go to other dimensions, and I want to shoot down spaceships, and you can do all that and ground it in, in, in the details of reality. Um, so I wrote this, I wrote this vampire story, um, this, this over the top vampire story, but it was this kind of, um, intimate personal piece about a guy who worked in a mortu- at a mortuary and in the workshop, um, the, the big praise I got from, um, a, the, the story wasn't perfect. It had, I mean, it had some issues, but the big thing that people really latched onto was they said, I've never read anything about what the inner workings of a mortuary are like, and and the uh, narrative sounds like the author has been there. Yeah. And people latched onto that. It wasn't that, oh, it's about vampires, so I'm excited to read about vampires. It was the mortuary stuff they all latched onto. Because when you, when when it doesn't have anything like that, it there's this detachment to the story and and between, you know, the writer and the reader. All, it's like all, climbing up a rock wall and not having any more handholds. Yeah, it's like you know, I tend to write, especially my prose. Uh, I I tend to write as if I'm talking to someone, and I'm tr- trying to explain to them what's so interesting about this story. Oh, uh, you know, and you know, when you talk to someone, you try not to bore them. <laughs> so um, you try to yeah, you try to con- cool. you try to connect with them. Uh, yeah. So that's basically what you're trying to do in the story, uh, because otherwise you're you're writing a uh, just a long plot summary uh, if you don't connect with them. Well, and that's a great check too, Mano, so for for folks to think about that kind of thing when they're writing, because um, when you're if you and I were just sitting down having a conversation and I just started telling you about something that happened yesterday and I started with going to the grocery store, you're hoping there's a point to this and I'm not just going to go down my grocery list. Oh, I know, I know. It's like you're boring, and, and and we've all known that person, right? Yes. You know, the person who uh, who who sits down, talks your ear off for half an hour, but never says anything interesting and. And is only just telling you about the day-to-day course of events, and you're like, well, who cares? It's all surface. And that's the thing, is that even your grand master idea with a thousand plot twists might come off as a grocery list. Yeah. If there's nothing 
there to connect you with it. So I just think that that's that's really important for folks to keep in mind when they're writing that uh, just because it happened to you doesn't make it dull. I think we get the idea that because because like like I said I, I empathize. I thought that when I was a kid all the time, and I found out that whenever I would try to write things that um that were uh you know you, you know genre things, whenever I would try to write things that I would just totally make up and and and, and put nothing else in it, a lot of the time I I found that I was completely mimicking somebody else. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean that's that can be a trap. Um, I also really resist. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no no no. What were you saying? Oh, I, I was just gonna say I I, I also really resist um, the notion that um, anybody's experiences are or, or, or anybody's lives are are, are, are are too dull or insignificant that they don't have enough to bring to the table. I mean, if your life is super dull and boring and you have nothing to write about, then you should probably leave your house and go do something. And then, maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe something will happen to you that's worth writing about. Um, but, but like, um, you know, you know, if you look at some of the most important writers of the last century, if you look at somebody like Stephen King, do you know the sheer number of, I mean, first of all, the man's written a million things. You know the sheer number of things Stephen King has written that were about writers? Um, I think I mean, it's 40 he's had, stories. So, he's had so many protagonists that were writers. Yes, yes. It's because that's what he is. Now, I, one of the things that, that I was always told um, in, in school was that, by, by multiple professors, was that it's uh, really risky to, to do a lot of stories about writing <laughs> for, you know, really obvious reasons. You're like, well, I'm writing right now and I have nothing more interesting to talk about, so I'm going to talk about writing. Um, a lot of the time that can come off as incredibly trite, especially poetry about writing. That's that's usually a big no-no. Um, but if I... But not that it can't be done well. But you, you look at somebody like... Um, you look at somebody like Stephen King and he's done it a bunch of times and it doesn't get old. I think... There are, there are certain ways to do that. You can't – see, your story, when, you, when you're writing uh, a story about a writer, I, I personally find, and I try to avoid this, uh, the story can't be about writing. <laughs> because, that's a great point. Because yeah. not everybody's a writer. Um, so stuff that's really, really important to you or something like oh, a, a, maybe another writer would get – would probably fly over a lot, a lot of people's heads and probably disconnect them. A lot of – actually, uh, you can you can look at the, a lot of Stephen King stories about writers really aren't about uh, writing them, themselves. It's um, – a lot of – well, a lot of these characters have psychosis. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, yeah, either they're going crazy or, or, or something like that. Um, them being a writer, I, I can give us a viewpoint into whatever horror – is approaching them like Barton Fink, for instance, from um, from the Coen Brothers. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that film, but it's about our this uh, really uh, well-respected uh, writer in oh, I can't remember the 30s, I think, um, who is a big hit on Broadway, and he's brought to L.A. to write a stupid wrestling movie. <laughs> and he he gets set up in a, a hotel room in L.A. Uh, it's not the best hotel. Uh, and he's going to sit down and write. He sits down, looks at his typewriter, is he no idea what to write. Um, and it's he starts going into this really – well, first off, the characters around him bring him into this hellish nightmare. Uh, but it's reflected uh, in, in his work and how his, his writing and his going kind of a little – crazy with boredom and you know kind of puts him into this world and you know Stephen King does that I actually read that the Coen brothers ended up writing Barton Fink when they were writing uh, Miller's Crossing and they got stuck and they didn't know where to go with the story and they were just frozen and they didn't know what to do and then they got this idea for Barton Fink like oh what about this other writer who, who doesn't know what to do oh uh, and they wrote that screenplay, and then they went back and finished uh, Miller's Crossing. <laughs> that's really interesting. And um, you know that that's a good. I, I think those are good ways to incorporate you know being a writer, uh, because if you're a writer or a filmmaker or an artist uh, of some sort, 
uh, a, a good way to use that in a story is to use it to uh, use that character's abilities to reflect either on you know, what's going on to them in the story or about life in general, but it should never be about <laughs> them actually being you know, a creator because that, that can get dull. Well, yeah, and it can potentially get too introspective, or even with other types of topics, you know, you know, to to potentially um, preachy about something, yeah. right? Yeah, and keep I mean, in mind, like, keep in mind, most of Stephen King's stories about writers are horror stories <laughs> that have ghosts and monsters and you know crazy people and murders. And it's like, well, yeah, because you know, if he just wrote about a guy just bored writing, <laughs> it wouldn't be really I, effective. A guy sitting at a desk, I, I just don't exactly know exactly immediately what the occasion for story is. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm currently reading uh, his book, his time travel novel about a guy who goes back in time and tries to stop the uh, JFK assassination, which immediately sounds like the most obvious time travel story ever, but it's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> it's really, really good. And uh, I'm not even to that that part yet, but it's oh, wow. really good. I am... And, I, it, it's about. I'm sorry. What? Oh no 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 finish. It, it's about an English teacher, and I you know immediately I went okay he's writing an English teacher because he's an English guy and that's going to be comfortable for him. Uh, but like the guy comes completely alive because Stephen King is able to uh, bring these personal experiences to the table. It's not about those. It's it, it's that when you're inside of somebody's head in a narrative and you have an internal monologue. Uh, the guy's got to relate whatever random experiences are going on to his life. And so he's going to talk about grading papers and how boring that is and uh, and all those sorts of things and, and he's and he's going to in his head correct people's crappy grammar and like like you know you, you get into the head of a person that does a particular thing. And um, not that it's also important to mention of course that that doesn't mean that you're um career or your job immediately completely defines you as a person um, because that can also get um, incredibly one-dimensional. This yeah. guy isn't just an English teacher. He's also all kinds of things. Manos isn't just a clerk at a department store. He's also a writer and he's a boyfriend and he, you know, he's all kinds of things. Um, but that's it. So, um, <laughs> well, well, well um, I don't know. Do, do I have to go down all of the things that you are? Um, no, that's but, quite all right. We don't have time. Oh, okay. And he's a Batman fan, and he he likes um he likes uh, lemonade. That's right. I love it. <laughs> um, but that wasn't random. He was telling about lemonade before we started recording. Um, but uh, but anyway, so um, or not lemonade. You were telling me about iced tea. Iced tea. Lemonade iced tea. That um, oh god, the guy, the guy who was a golfer made it. Uh, Arnold Palmer. Arnold Palmer. Yeah. Yeah. I highly re I highly recommend that stuff. Um, the, another thing I, I, I want to mention um, b b before we go is that um, I also think that, as I was, as I was mentioning earlier, that um, the creative aspect of writing isn't just in the brilliant ideas that no one's ever seen before, or the brilliant situation that you can create with all these plot twists that make a reader go, <gasps> what? Um, it's also about the language, and it's also about the way you present it. Man Manos was talking about communication, and I think this would be a, a great place to book in, a great way to book in this, um, is that uh, a lot of the creative part of writing is in the writing itself. It's in the way that you tell the story. It's in the, it's, it's in the words that you use, the way you put the language together, what you choose to tell us when and what details you use to, um, to imply things um, about your characters and about the world that they inhabit. And you can tell a story where that is about something that personally happened to you that you that you create as a fiction because you changed exactly two elements, you know, three three things. Um, this is this is how it happened, except I embellished in these parts, and that immediately makes it fiction. And that's not any more or less of a creative work. Then I sent a bunch of guys to space and they went and fought monsters. <laughs> and I just think that that's important to mention because I, I think some people get the idea that well that well that's lame. It happened to me and nobody's gonna gonna want to know about it. Or it's not you know I I can't I can't make it fiction. Um, but you can. And in fact sometimes it's it, it will seem more real if you make it fiction and you don't just tell it like it was. That's a really interesting phenomenon. That I'm sure you've run into, Manos? Yes, I have, yes. 
Uh, uh, how many times have you read stories where you're like, yeah, I don't buy that. That can never happen. And then the author might come back and say, no, that's exactly how it happened. And it's like, well, in the, in the context of the story, I couldn't suspend my disbelief. I didn't buy it. I've had – here's the thing. Sometimes – this happens to me particularly in movies uh, where a movie with a fantastic like fantasy premise will lose me when the humans don't act like humans. Yeah. And, you know, I'll go like, okay, I buy the flaming motorcycle guy. <laughs> that I believe. But, Gee, I wonder what film we're discussing. Yeah, but the way these two characters are talking to each other, I totally don't get. I'm out of the movie. It's like, I'm sorry, but nobody eats jelly beans out of a goblet. <laughs> I'm not buying that. It doesn't happen. So it's like, you know, it, that, it, that, that, that's what it's all about, you know. All that other awesome stuff is fun window dressing, and you know, and oh, uh, and you know, icing, you know, on the cake. You know, it's delicious. I love icing on a cake. It's one of my favorite parts. Uh, but there's got to be cake in the middle of it. Yeah. Oh, uh, exactly. Uh, you can't eat icing all day, or you'd get sick. I know. I mean, it'd be awesome for a while, but <laughs> then you would get sick. You could drink it down with Mountain Dew. <laughs> I, I i think i think it's also um it, it would probably be uh remiss of me not to also say that if you're um that if there's something you really want to write about that you think would be really fantastic really really interesting you've got a character in your head that you want to create around a world that you don't know enough about there's nothing stopping you from research no there's nothing i i tend to i i've been doing this quite a bit actually um, I have the the sort of courtesan story I'm working on, which takes place in pre-revolutionary France. Guess what? I've never been there. <laughs> what? I know. So I have to kind of figure out, like, you know, what's my take on this story? Um, uh, you know, what's what's my viewpoint of what's going on in this story? Because you know, um, it's it's a cool adventure story with a, a bunch of oh. Uh, hilarious sex and violence i think um but i still have a point of view to put through the story otherwise it's just you know just anything um uh, but a couple of maybe okay ideas um uh, so you know that that's that's what you need to do as a writer um and also it goes both ways i i, I don't know if this is off topic or anything but you know um i i've noticed like sometimes fans will bring their own uh metaphors and and meanings to work that maybe sometimes the creators weren't intending. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like I don't think I don't think that um, uh, Stanley meant the X Men as a gay metaphor. Uh, I'm pretty certain of that. From back in the early '60s, you know, he did me mean it as you know he he did but, talk about so a civil rights yeah. metaphor, but it does actually kind of fit uh, you know the gay uh, experience even better. Oh. Well, and certainly since then, people have written it that way. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's what people have brought, like either you know writers and also you know fans as well. And I've seen it happen. I think good work stands on its own, man. So I think that I, I think I think that good artistic fiction, and I've probably said this a thousand times, but it, maybe it bears repeating, um, is is uh, is work where maybe the I mean I mean obviously the person that wrote it had their intentions, but it becomes its own thing it, it it gets a life of its own and when a reader comes to something or or a viewer of a film or something uh comes comes to something and they have their own read on it and they can back that um that reading of it up with uh you know myriad uh examples from the story it's it's hard to say well that's not what the guy meant so it's not there <laughs> and what's really what's really interesting is that that I mean I think that's part of that's part of the point of storytelling. I think that's one of the reasons that, that we that we do it and should do it is because um, we discover uh, things about ourselves and about other people through doing the work. You know, through through the writing of fiction, we discover things about ourselves. Um, through reading that fiction, other people discover things about the people that the, the the person that wrote it. But sometimes there's things there that they didn't even know they put there, and sometimes they didn't put it there and it's there on accident. And that's interesting too. I, I I have seen that. I've spoken with um, uh, with writers who, you know, you'd ask them, 
like, oh, yeah, you totally meant this as, you know, as a metaphor. And they'll go, no, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> like, oh, really? Well, okay, because I, I, well, you weren't thinking it, but it happened. Uh, but it's there. You know, it yeah. made it into the work. And importantly, that doesn't make it invalid. Oh, no, actually, uh, it also just almost proves proves it. I mean, it you can't fight it as a, as a writer. You, it, you know, if it's working... It's gonna either you know make it either subconsciously, or or right there uh, out in the open, because uh, it, it, it's an honest work, and that and I, I think that's what a writer just needs to just do their best to you know try and put forth. Well, I'll mention Stephen King again. Something he said in his book on writing was, uh, "You you don't start with theme." And when you're writing a story about a person that does some stuff and they go through an adventure, <laughs> uh, themes are going to inevitably pop up. And what he always uh, suggests that people do, this isn't the only way to do it, um, but I like his method. He says, um, you write a draft and you get it done and you, you do no revision on it until you finish the last paragraph. Yeah. And then you get away from it for like a month. You just don't even touch it. You just you just leave it leave it for a month. Get get distance from it. Uh, do other things. Maybe write on other projects. You come back to it, and then you read it again. And now you are as you you are as fresh as you can make yourself, having been the person that wrote it, and obviously knowing where it's going. Yeah. That's and true. then you will inevitably, especially if um, if it's good, you will inevitably find connections, thematic connections that you didn't mean to put in the work, but are there. And then that second revision is about drawing those out a little bit, put, putting them more in the forefront, and um, making it more of a cohesive piece in a thematic way as well as in just a narrative way. And what, what, I, what I think is really interesting about that is that th this happens, um, if this happens for him on every project he writes, that means it happens to everybody. Yeah. And things that you're putting out finished products that are likely to have connections that the person that that that, that, that wrote it never met. Um, there there are there are so many people that have um, that have that have that have made things um, where where uh, the, they'll put it out and they go it didn't mean anything. <laughs> you know, uh, I was just telling a story about a dude that went and did stuff and had an adventure. <laughs> and and then and then you know we get our hands on it and we go yeah but but this is here and this and this seems like maybe it's an allegory to this or here 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 are these um you know you know you know paralleling character arcs and and um you know a lot of authors don't mean to put those things there and I think oftentimes it's it's you know uh, not a good idea to try to well it's never a good idea to force those things uh, no it's not it <laughs> oh. <laughs> never force those things but uh, um, i i found you know I, I i'm sure you found that in uh your own work where things uh, specifically uh the girl with seven last name uh seven first names oh uh, well, i should i should write that that should be the third book in the yeah the, but, <laughs> the girl with seven last names yeah it's like oh man you just thought that was all yeah, you thought first names. You you thought two first names is a problem. Just wait till you get two last names. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. We're, but uh, what, what, yeah, what but I'm, gonna, I mean, your what, what your great universe in that book is so huge. I'm sure as you were writing it, connections that you didn't intend all uh, started to happen, right? Well, yeah, absolutely. And uh, a lot of the time, I would notice something uh, that would that would kind of kind of crop up, and I would take the opportunity to further it. And I got you know great ideas from that, and it went it went places that it never would have gone had I not thought of that. And in fact, I also have a tendency to do that with mistakes. Yeah, as long where, as, as um, long as you keep your see that uh, the important thing is to keep your mind open for that. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I you just can't take yourself too seriously. So sometimes um, when, when I when I'm writing, uh, I've done this with that. I did. I've done this with Spawn Year. I don't mind saying um, I, I've I've had places where I'll go, oh man, I totally botched that. I did not intend that. And sometimes, uh, especially in Spawn Year, because I can't revise that. Um, but but with but with with that book, um, there, there there have been a there were a couple places in the novel where. Um, where uh, I, I did something I didn't mean to, and then uh, I found a way to run with it. Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, like it never occurred to me, I've said this before, but I don't know if people have, have heard me say this, um, that, I, that my, my, uh, my, my main character, Franklin Bryce, well, Franklin and Bryce are two first names, and I, I didn't think of that when I was writing it, but the, the, but, but the idea uh, in, the, in the book of 
having two first names is supposed to be like like uh like a really bad thing you know you you, you have really bad luck in the multiverse if you have two first names um it didn't occur to me that franklin did and he's the main character so um 40 pages in uh i write in uh this thing where the character along with me the author suddenly realizes it and i made it a big part of his character art yeah i mean that's that's great you acknowledged uh that and and you used it beautifully I, mean, I could have fixed it. Yeah, you, you know, I could have gone back and had him know it from the beginning. But the fact that he was new to the multiverse, to, to understanding the multiverse, the fact that he was a normal human that didn't used to have superpowers, he's wet behind the ears, he's not ready for all of this, it, it just felt like a fit, so I left it in there. Yeah, and that's a totally human thing for Bryce not to really have that occur to him. Because he's him, you know. <laughs> when You can see yeah. other people's problems and issues uh, much more clearly than you can see your own. Well, I think you're right, Manos. I think we did go off on an entirely different topic there at the end for the last 15 minutes, but, um... <laughs> yeah, you know, hey. <laughs> but that's okay, because uh, it was interesting, and we haven't um, we haven't gotten together and talked about writing in a long time, so I'm really glad we did that. Uh, did you have any final thoughts on this topic? Uh, I, I, I think that's it. I just, uh... I, I, I can't imagine, you know, not using that. I mean, if you really are, are terrified that you know, you can't use, you know, life experiences or, you know, or perceptions or visions or just philosophies, then you have nothing. I, I don't know where you can start, really. Uh, it kind of baffles me. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, yeah, like like my original point, it's like art is communication. And, you know, it, go, it does go both ways uh, to the to the writer and the fans. Uh, and to... to I don't know, to arbitrarily think of like, oh, I must think of something, you know, incredibly original and sterile. That's, you're creating something sterile and something really unapproachable. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, everybody, thanks as always for listening to Geese Niners, the podcast. We sure appreciate it. And uh, man, I'll come back again really soon. I've missed having you on the channel a lot. I missed it too. Uh, I will be here soon. Yay! Manos will be here soon. And in the meantime, we'll see you again very soon with more videos, I'm sure. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm the real Manos. We'll see you later.